Welcome Gideon Cordova, the Greens candidate for the Legislative Council, and welcome back to the show. Good morning. Thanks for having me, Annie. Now, Gideon, since last Thursday, the journey on the uh, campaign trail, would you like to share? Absolutely. It's been very busy, but it's been wonderful having so many conversations so many conversations with, with the people in Huon. Uh, I've done Signet Market, and Signet Market is such a vibrant and buzzing place to be. When, on market day, it's just fantastic to see the range of things on offer and also the people that come out. We have a great diversity of people from all walks of life and all backgrounds, and having a chat to them, you realise the complexity of being in the Legislative Council and the complexity, uh, or the nuance of understanding that's required. Because when we talk about the community, we're not just talking about one homogenous group. We're talking about different people with different interests, different life experiences and different needs. So that's why it's important, I think, for the Legislative Council in the seat of Hewan, you need somebody who has values. And it always comes back to values. You know, it's a house of review. And when you've got legislation that's across a plethora of issues, you need to know that you can trust that your local member has your interests at heart. And so that's why I've really been putting my values first, integrity, compassion, action, making sure that it's not just talking the talk, but it's actually walking the walk. I mean, we hear a lot of people raising the issues as we run through this election, I've heard so many people say, oh, so many issues, issues, issues. But the question is, what action are you going to take to deal with those issues? So anyway, since last Thursday, apart from Signet Market, we did lots of letterboxing and door knocking. We've been door knocking in Snug. But really importantly, I was down at Willie Smith the other night with the Hewan Valley Tourism Network. And what was so interesting about that was to see the range of businesses that are doing incredible things. Local small operators who have an eco-focus, sustainability focus, and they're creating good jobs in the region. Um, I was having a chat to Hewan River Cruises, having a chat to the new ideas for the Palawa, uh, Palawa uh, Lagana track. So these are like basically eco and sustainable tourism opportunities, and as well as the artists and makers of the Huon, the Art and Away Trail. There's all kinds of really incredible local business owners that are operating here in the Huon, and uh, we need to support them. And something I haven't heard enough about so far, I believe, in this election campaign is what are we going to do to help small businesses to make sure that they can flourish. There's so many of them that are leading the way in terms of eco and sustainability, and I believe these are the jobs of the future. Andy, I'd also just like to point out that one of the really exciting things about that Huon Valley Tourism Network event was the we had a range of speakers from all different um, kind of businesses and initiatives that are taking place. One of them was the Huon Valley Jobs Hub, which is about to start. There's going to be a Huon Valley Jobs Authority, Jobs Hub Authority, and this will basically be able to connect people to the jobs that they need and the employers that are out there. So that's a terrific initiative that's just starting. But something that really piqued my interest was Emily from the Huon Valley Food Hub had a chat to us about localising food systems. And this is something that I was talking to you about last week, where... I really don't like the fact that whenever there's some kind of problem overseas, it damages our supply chains and then we can't get the stuff that we need right here at home. And there's no need for that because we have so much talent and capacity right here at home, we should be supporting those locals. So an example that they used was from Vermont in the US where there is one supermarket there in a town where 70 cents from every dollar that's spent at that supermarket goes straight back into the community. Because what they've done is they've localised their food systems so that when you go to the supermarket in that town, whenever you spend $1, 70 cents goes straight back into the pockets of the people who, who run that town, who live in that town, who work and play and recreate in that town. That's how we're going to build thriving communities, is by making sure that we're resilient, adaptable, and that we keep things closer to home. And I really think that there's a huge opportunity out there for people in Huon if we can just start thinking about the circular economy, thinking about localising our food systems... Um, I think this, this Huon Valley Food Hub, is it's the first initiative of its type in Tasmania and I think it's just fantastic, the opportunities that it presents for all of us. It does. I was just thinking with the restrictions in COVID, the, one of the things good come out, people got their, back into doing their own sustainable, sustainable lifestyle and getting back to how it was back in the yesteryear. Absolutely. It's a, it's a, it's a breath of fresh air and I was just... It's just not so. It's just as important, not just just knock on doors as you've mentioned. Businesses get in there at the coalface, speak to businesses, and see their concerns. Genuine, you know, their concerns exactly. where they need help and support. Exactly. And to, you know, there's so many businesses that are actually leading the way in Huon when it comes to net zero emissions or net negative emissions. And some of these businesses, like I was talking to the um, Tasmanian Cycle Tourism, the, uh, these businesses that are creating so many really good jobs, but they're also doing it in a way that's actually really positive the, for the planet. And the idea here is, I think, that in 100 years' time, we want 
the quality of life, the material standard of living and the environment in our neighbourhood to be better than it was today. Every generation we should be improving and improving. And the sad thing to me is that when I actually look around, I don't feel very confident at the moment with this mob that's currently in power. I don't feel very confident that things are getting better. I mean, if you look around, you know, I still live with my mum. I know you hear Toby talk about things like that as well. Um, there are fewer people that own houses now than there were last generation. Not only that, there's more people in mortgage stress now than there was in the last generation. There's more people who owe more to the banks now than in the last generation. So I feel like we were sold this myth that if you just run trickle-down economics, if you just give money to the very tippy-top 1%, the billionaires and the 100 millionaires, if you just pile all the resources into them by giving them free stuff, fossil fuel subsidies and whatever, then eventually that will trickle down to you and me uh, here in Hewan. And it doesn't work. In fact, not only does it not work, but we have worse material outcomes now than we did before. And, you know, when I hear some of the candidates in this election, I feel like we actually need people who are willing to stand up with positive solutions that are going to fix things. So whether that's having a youth job guarantee for Hewan, whether that's um, banning corporate donations to political parties, you know, I really want to make sure that whoever wins in Hewan, that they're actually going to pledge to ban corporate political donations. I don't see any reason how you could possibly justify taking a million dollars a year from the fossil fuel industry. Why do we think that those major parties are going to represent us? Because at the end of the day, they're not going to respond to your tweets. They're not going to respond to your your letters, your sternly worded letters. What they're going to respond to is whoever's paying them a million dollars a year from some dodgy, massively polluting company, mostly that are based overseas anyway. Um, and we actually do have the solutions in front of us to fix that. One of them would be real-time donations disclosure, so that if somebody makes a donation to a party, you know about it immediately within seven days. Another thing is to make sure that only natural persons are allowed to donate. What I mean by that is right now, corporations keep donating to politicians, which means that the politician is they're not just donating because they love democracy, they're donating because they want to purchase political outcomes. And to me, that is a legalised version of bribery. It's a very corrosive... It's basically institutionalising and normalising a kind of corruption. It's legalised corruption, but it shouldn't be. So I would definitely ban corporate political donations. I'd have real-time disclosures and I'd set election spending limits so that candidates can't spend more than a certain amount of money. That's really important because we don't want to have a kind of democracy like what you see in the United States where it's pay to play. You know, the richest people dominate the airwaves, the richest people dominate the conversation. Uh, we're seeing that more and more sadly in Australia. I mean, if you've been following the federal election campaign as well, I mean, there's just a, you know, a few really big players who have millions upon millions of dollars. And to me, that really corrodes the, the genuine conversations that we should be having with people in the community. Gideon, it's uh, so important to have a vision and set goals. Is it uh, an option, I don't know the curriculum in the education department, to start educating people in areas like sustainable living, sustainable lives, about a number of issues? Is that in the cur curriculum or is it something that should be really looked at? Education, more education. What a good idea. And I think the first and most important factor of that is to fund education properly. So the Greens, for example, have a policy to wipe student debt and make university free and TAFE free. Now, this is something, you know, I grew up in Alan's Rivulet. And to be able to have access to world-class education is critically important to the kind of outcomes that young people have. Did you know that the greatest predictor of life expectancy in Australia is your postcode? It isn't your genetics or anything like that. It isn't your heritage. It is your postcode. And that's because in very, very rich parts of the town, they fund things better, and in poorer parts of the town, they don't. And that, to me, is an absolute abrogation of the responsibility of representative government. So I would say that we need to make TAFE free, we need to have free university education, and we need to wipe student debt. And that way we can start to see a world-class education system. If you look in Finland, the, I mean, Finland is regularly voted that like the, the best education system in the world, and part of the reason for that is their teachers are supported, they're funded. And their teachers are well-educated because they have an education system that's public and that helps everyone. So it doesn't matter what postcode you live in in Finland, you get world-class education. And that's what we could do here if we wanted to. Just tell me on fees and that, because they are prohibitive. A friend of mine from Nepal, he's out here doing all the work and doing the university. I could have thought he said twenty-five, forty-five, or something thousand dollars. Oh, yeah. You know, oh, it, yeah. It's, so you're saying free in that area to get... and. People from overseas, they generate through spending money in the, the community anyway, so that should be looked at, you say, fr free. Yeah, for, are my... people from overseas travelling to... 
Well, at the moment, for example, in New Zealand, yeah. like it's only for New Zealand residents, but in Germany, it's anyone anywhere in the world can go to Germany and get free university education. Now, why does Germany do that? Bear in mind that they have the largest economy in Europe now. How did they get there? Well, they've got a well-educated workforce. So you've got to think of things in the macro sense in terms of productivity. The more well-educated and upskilled your workforce is, the higher productivity they have, and therefore the more dividends that the whole community gets back when they go out into the workforce. So if you're constantly perpetuating very low wage, very insecure and very poor types of jobs, after you know 200 years, you're still going to have um, communities that aren't being supported. Whereas if you really invest in education, including having people from all walks of life have access to the best kind of education, then you'll start to see that mm. they'll be the new entrepreneurs of the next generation, they'll be the new leaders, and they'll also be the ones who really believe in improving the material standard of living of the people who are in those communities. And that's something I genuinely believe in, is the transformative role that education plays in bringing people a better life. But really importantly, I mean, we're talking now kind of in long-term visions of you know what we can do to achieve world-class education. But we have to remember that for those people who didn't get world-class education because of a failure of government over the last 40 years, those people deserve really well-paid, secure jobs as well. So we have to make sure that we don't just endlessly talk about, you know, upskilling and giving people, uh, you know, upskilling, training, making them, the government often talks about making people job ready. If there are no jobs around, what's the point of being job ready? You might be ready as you want to be, but if there's no jobs around then it's really hard to get a job. So that's why I've been banging on a lot about a job guarantee, making sure that anybody who wants a job should be able to get one and that there is an implicit guarantee made by government because there's heaps of things to do for the public purpose out there. There's heaps of things to do. I was just talking to the volunteer firefighters and isn't it incredible that those volunteer firefighters who keep us safe, they don't have an extra field officer that they need here in the Southwest District. So I think it's absolutely critical that we employ those people, that we get more firefighters, for example, and we adequately resource these things. And believe me, it saves a lot more money in the long run if you actually have the resources that you need for the frontline healthcare workers, the frontline fireys, the volunteers that are doing amazing work. If you actually invest now, it saves you a lot in the long run because believe me, the cleanup operation from not having adequately resourced our firefighters is a lot more expensive. But also think of the human heartache and tragedy that takes place when you don't adequately resource your fiery. So that's why I was very pleased this week to sign the pledge to support a new field officer for our region um, for the, for the, to give support to our volunteer firefighters who, let's be honest, they put their lives on the line to keep us safe. We should be doing everything we can to support them. Another issue I think that, and bear in mind the Legislative Council plays a huge role in this, is mental health care, making sure that we all have access to really good mental health services and provisions. And that's why I think we need an urgent inquiry into mental health uh, across the state, but particularly here in Hewan. And this is something that, you know, I lament a bit when I hear the candidates in this election say, well, all you do when you get into the upper house is you sit there and you wait for a reviews, you wait for somebody to put something on your desk before you do anything, and then you just, you know, review things. Well, actually, you have a role in being able to put forward legislation as well. Look at Mike Gaffney. Um, Mike Gaffney put forward the voluntary assisted dying legislation. That was an upper house bill, and he managed to get that all the way through the parliament. So you can change things. That's why I want to be a proactive member of the upper house. I'm not just going to sit there twiddling my thumbs, waiting for legislation to be put on my desk. I'll be proactive. I'll be talking about a youth job guarantee, talking about making sure our firefighters get the resources that they need, talking about resilience and, um, and natural disaster mitigation, and I'll be talking about mental health as well. That's right, it's about action, getting out there, the coal fine, just actioning. Absolutely. Right. Integrity, yeah. compassion Integrity. and action. Absolutely. Anything else this morning you'd like to uh, mention, Gideon? We've got a few more minutes up our five minutes up our sleeve, to be honest, so you can yeah. condense it. Absolutely. Yeah, thank Look, you. all the way through, as I've been talking to these small businesses, talking to people on the doors, there is this common frame, health, housing, transport and climate action. This is what I've been hearing again and again. Health, housing, transport, climate action. Now, everybody from all different walks of life has different reasons for needing that. For example, you know, I, I hurt my knee. I needed an ACL replacement for my knee. That took me three years on the public health waiting list. Three years. And then in the end, they had to move me to the private anyway as one of these so-called blitzes where because the elective surgery wait list was so long in the public system, they moved people to the private system. 
well, that just costs everyone so much more money to do it that way. Whereas if they'd adequately resourced it in the first place, obviously we wouldn't be waiting um, three years to get elective surgery and it would be more cost efficient to do so. I remember talking to somebody who was from Bulgaria and they said they said that in Bulgaria, if somebody has to wait two months for elective surgery, they're furious. It's just, and I was like, well, here we are in Tasmania, part of the, one of the richest countries in the world at the richest time in human history, and we're waiting three years, even just trying to get a GP appointment, waiting weeks. It doesn't make sense. And to me, we've had ample opportunity under the current kind of born to rule types who are in power. And when I say this, I mean both Labor and Liberal kind of expect that they're going to get our votes every single time and we'll just oscillate between Labor and Liberal and Labor and Liberal. I don't think so, not anymore. I think there's a real move towards the Greens, a real move towards more independent voices. But we have to make sure that those independent voices that we do get in are actually going to stand up to the corporate donations. They're actually going to ban corporate donations. And if they're not willing to say out loud that they support a ban on corporate donations to politicians, I think we're in for some real trouble. Now, Gordian Cordova, why should people vote for you? I think people should vote for me because I lead with my values. Integrity, compassion and action. And I believe that we have a very bright future in Hewan if we put the spotlight where it needs to be on health, on housing and on climate. I feel like I've got the tenacity, the work ethic and the fundamental belief that all of us have a part to play and all of us can actually work together. I'm not that adversarial type of person who's constantly, um, you know, making making a hard time and, and, and bickering. I'm actually there to get the job done and be positive while I'm doing it. Good man, good uh, Gideon Cordova, the uh, candidate for the uh, Legislative uh, Council for the Greens, is uh, the voting is on Saturday. I wish you well. All the best for it. Thank Thanks you so for much. Coming in. Good to see you. you. Thank you. You too. That's all for this week, for this, pr- for this show, for your point of view. I'd like to thank you all for listening. Take care. Look after one another. Until next week. Bye for now. Authorised by DRES Tasmanian Greens Hobart.